Tonight's speaker is Jennifer Hurley. She's a principal of Hurley and Franks Associates in Philadelphia. Um, she has over 15 years of uh, professional experience facilitating public involvement in planning and development issues. She's worked on numerous charrettes for form-based zoning, regional planning, re neighborhood, and downtown re revitalization. Uh, she currently serves on the board of the Congress for New Urbanism nationally, the Transect Codes Council, and the Form Based Codes Institute Advisory Board. So, with that, Jennifer Hurley. Thanks, Doug. Thanks, everyone, for having me here. Um, so, to give you a little preview of what we're going to do tonight, uh, as Doug mentioned, I uh, I'm a specialist in facilitating public involvement. I don't like to just stand up here and spout off um, my beliefs, although I could do that for a long time. Um, but what we're going to do is have a series of uh, conversations at your tables mixed in with some little mini presentations from me about affordable housing issues. So to kick it off, um, I like to start things out by people being active instead of passive. So the first thing we're going to do is a little discussion at your table. So you see on every table has a set of pictures. Every table has the same set of pictures. These are just prompts for discussion. And so the first question is to take a look at the pictures at your table and talk with the other people at your table about what elements in these pictures reflect things that you would like to see for the future of affordability in Portsmouth. Now, I know that everybody is going to want to look at them and tell me the things that you don't like. That's the second question. So first question, focus just on the things that you like. Um, and make notes right on the pictures themselves about the things that you like. Uh, and be as specific as you can. And we'll have a few minutes for this, and then I'll bring you back. Okay, if you could start to wrap up your discussion at your table. You're going to get another shot at these same pictures a little bit later in the evening. So affordability is a very complicated problem. Uh, it's more than a complicated problem. It's a very complex problem with lots of moving pieces that are constantly moving in different directions. So before I get into talking about some of the tools that can help support affordability, I want to talk a little bit about how we think about affordability. So the first question I have is, what makes a place affordable? How do we even think about that question? And for a long time, the way people thought about that question was that housing is affordable if it costs less than 30% of your income. That is sort of the standard rule of thumb. And you can see on this map, the uh, yellow areas are metro areas where the median housing price is less than 30% of the median income. So even by that standard, all the blue areas are unaffordable. So lots of metro areas around the country have a problem with affordability. But housing is the largest uh, expenditure in the consumer side. It's the largest household expenditure. But transportation is the second largest household expenditure. And people are now starting to look at affordability as a combination of housing and transportation costs. That housing should be 30% of less of your income, and transportation should be 15% or less of your income. So combined, it should be 45% or less of your income. And when you use that standard, all the metro areas have a much bigger problem. So that's a little depressing. 
Um, but it's also good news because it gives us some more tools for dealing with how to help people live more a more affordable life, how to have places that enable a more affordable life. So how does Portsmouth stack up um, in this uh, way? Um, Portsmouth, the median uh, typical uh, resident hits right at the 45% mark. Um, so if you uh, have the median household size and the median number of commuters and make the median income um, and are living in a median cost house, you're hitting right at that 45% mark. Um, so how, what that means uh, is that people are spending a lot on transportation here. Your housing is just below that 30% mark but the transportation costs are higher than that 15% target. Um, people, uh, the average household vehicle miles traveled in a year is more than 22,000, which is quite a lot. Um, and people are spending more than $13,000 a year on transportation costs. That's the quote, regional typical household in this model. So all those median numbers. That means that you know, roughly half the people are spending more than this. So how does that stack up against your neighbors? So Dover has slightly cheaper housing costs, but more expensive transportation costs. So overall, they're really in about the same spot you are. There it's 44% instead of 45%. Um, Boston has expensive housing costs, but relatively cheap transportation costs compared to you. And so the total number there is actually quite a bit less than here. Um, for the region as a whole, you're better off than the region as a whole. The region as a whole is looking at almost 50% for those two costs combined. Uh, but looking at just the median household doesn't tell the whole story. Um, for one thing, affordability is not distributed geographically equally across the region. And moderate and lower income households spend a higher percentage of their income on housing and transportation than the typical household does. So this map is looking at the uh, defined moderate income household, which is 80% of median income. So here, um, median income is roughly $73,000, somewhere in that range. So 80% of median is about 55. Um, so when you look at this map, for a moderate income household, the core of Portsmouth is actually the most affordable place to live when you can consider housing costs and transportation costs together. Um, when you look at housing only, Portsmouth as a whole looks more affordable. There are more neighborhoods that are more affordable. There's a larger part of the city that looks affordable. But then when you look at transportation only, it changes the equation because transportation, your transportation costs are relatively expensive and they're relatively expensive throughout the city, but they're slightly more expensive in other neighbors, neighborhoods than in the core. So why are we even talking about affordability? Why is a smart growth organization talking about affordability? What's the connection? Um, it's not just because we care about people who are having a hard time paying their bills. Affordability is a key issue for smart growth because you can't have walkable neighborhoods without affordability. Walkable neighborhoods require affordability so that people can live near where they work and walk to their jobs and walk to stores. And affordable neighborhoods need walkability so that people aren't spending too much money on their transportation. In neighborhoods that have no walkability, um, cost and, and no access to transit, transportation costs are um, systematically higher than in neighborhoods where there is walkability. If a family can get by with one car instead of two, it's a huge annual cost savings. So that's why affordability is a smart growth issue. But what, why does this happen? Why is housing so expensive? What is going on, you know, uh, uh, when, um, you know, when TVs get too expensive, 
people build more TVs and the cost comes down. So why isn't this happening with housing? Well, one thing is, is one key issue is supply. There's not enough supply of housing to meet demand. And if production doesn't keep up with the demand, then prices rise. And it has to be the right type of supply in the right location. Um, demand preferences for housing are shifting and the supply is not keeping up with those shifts. And those shifts are related to demographic changes and uh, consumer preference changes. So demographically, we're going through a time period where we're seeing a dramatic growth in small households and households without children. So by 2025, it's expected that 75 to 85 percent of all the households in the U.S. will not have children. This is, a, this is an all-time low, <laughs> and it's a really dramatic change. Um, you don't need to be able to read the numbers here. You just have to see the picture on the line. Uh, these are just population numbers, not household numbers. But the blue line is total population. It's been rising at a very straight, steady rate. Um, the uh, uh, green line there is children. And so I'm sorry for the people who are over there. <laughs> so you can see that there was a peak, you know, the baby boomer peak. There were lots of kids. And now the number of children has dropped to an all-time low. So the change in household size and household composition is changing the kind of housing that people are looking for. We're also seeing shifts in where people want to live that's related to this, but not, uh, uh, it's, it's not entirely dependent on this, but they're connected to each other. Um, there are several surveys now that indicate that somewhere between 30 and 50% of the US population would prefer to live in a walkable location. So even the very conservative surveys are saying it's at least 30%. And we don't have 30% 30, 30 of our places are not walkable locations. Um, and those numbers are even higher in the population groups that are the biggest uh, consumers of a housing, that are the biggest population groups. So 56% of college-educated millennials say they want to live in a walkable location, and 36% of active boomers say they want to live in a walkable location, even though most of them spent most of their lives living in an auto-oriented kind of suburb. So this preference for where people live, the kind of place that people live, is pushing really, um, uh, is putting a lot of pressure on prices in core areas like Portsmouth. Um, I apologize if the line here is a little too faint, but the, the light gray line, um, and I don't have a pointer, but this light gray line right here is housing prices in the 1980s. The peak is uh, zero, zero miles from the CBD, so right down in the core, right in the downtown. In the 1980s, the house prices 15 and 20 miles out from the downtown core were actually higher than the prices in the downtown core. But that curve started to shift in the 90s. And now this line at the top is what we see in 2010. So the prices are highest right in the core. And it, this is the steepest drop off that we've seen any time in the last 30 years. Um, and by the time you get to about five miles out from the downtown core, then you have a very flat curve. So there's incredible market pressure right now on housing that is uh, small units and that is centrally located, located in walkable locations. Um, Arthur C. Nelson, Nelson has written Reshaping Metropolitan America. If you are interested in these numbers, there's an entire book that goes into these numbers in great detail. He estimates that there's a national shortage of 35 million units in small housing types, attached and small housing types. And locally, we're seeing that drive up the prices. So um, Chris Leining, Leinberger did a study of um, uh, prices in Boston comparing walkable locations 
versus auto-oriented drivable locations. And across all product types, office, hotel, retail, housing, across all product types, he saw a price premium of somewhere between 20 and 134% for the walkable locations compared to the drivable locations. And that also makes tax revenue uh, much higher. Uh, so in many ways, this is good news for lots of municipalities that have been struggling you know, since the 60s with disinvestment, but it's a real challenge for affordability. Um, and the reason why supply is so key is because of the way housing filters through different market segments. So to improve your affordability profile, you don't have to just build new affordable housing. Uh, there are times when even building new expensive help housing is going to help keep, on average, a place more affordable. And I'm going to look at that just briefly here to make sure this is making sense. So there's different kinds of housing. And there's different prices of housing. Our existing housing stock has very cheap housing and very expensive housing and everything in between. Well, let's say Bob decides to move to town. And Bob has a lot of money and he can buy anything he wants, but he really, really wants to live here. And so he's going to buy the nicest thing he can find, whatever it is. And no matter how many people are bidding against him, he's got enough money, he's going to be able to buy it. So if there's an expensive new house for him to buy, he's going to buy that expensive new house. Great. Bob's happy. If there's not an expensive new house to buy, Bob's going to buy the nicest house he can find, even if it was an existing house. And that's going to bid up the price on that house. And then somebody who wanted to live in that kind of housing can't afford it anymore. And so they're going to bid up the price on the house that used to be a little bit cheaper. And then somebody who would have bought that house can't afford that house anymore, and so they're gonna bid up the price on the one farther down the line. And this keeps going. This is called gentrification. So housing units filter kind of, uh, people filter up and down. Uh, they're move up buyers, you've heard that term. Housing units, as they get older, and as they get, um, their amenities aren't uh, meeting the current market, they tend to filter down into uh, lower price levels. And that's why it's so important to have a range of housing uh, ages um, because new housing is almost always more expensive than similar housing that's older. So the growth in housing supply has to keep up with demand or prices are going to rise. And some research has shown that when you have vacancy rates lower than 10% in rental housing, you get increases in rent. 10% um, is a pretty healthy rental vacancy rate. I know a lot of places that have much lower vacancy rates than that. And you're going to see increases in prices. So, but unfortunately, I can't tell you just to go out and build a whole bunch of new housing and that will solve your housing affordability problem. Um, Oh, sorry, I was going to give you just one more thing uh, before I jump to that. Um, here's some numbers specifically for the Boston metro area. I don't have the numbers just on Portsmouth. This is from that same data analysis from Arthur Nelson. He's estimating that between 10, 2010 and 2030, 575,000 new housing units are needed in this region. Um, that's 18% of what existed at the start of this time period. But it's interesting where those housing units are going to be needed, what kind of housing units are going to be needed. 71% of the increase is in rental units, not owner units. 99% of the increase is um, houses without, households without children. And 95% of the increases is households with people 65 and plus. So this is a dem the demographics that are driving the uh, need for new housing units. So even if his numbers are off by a lot, there's still a huge demand for um, new housing units that are 
uh, hitting that market of smaller households. So, but houses aren't widgets. They're not like televisions. And so more supply isn't enough by itself. Um, their housing markets are unique because land has some properties that other consumer goods don't have. Land is in a fixed location. Uh, and so each piece of land is somewhat unique. And typically, urban land gets its value because of what's around it. So urban land is valuable because of the amenities you can reach near it. That's why you normally see land prices higher in the central core or in uh, you know, other denser locations. But as more people move into an area, then that attracts more amenities for an area. So let's say all these people move in. Because there are more people there now, there's more buying power. And so because there's more buying power, these stores decide to move in. Well, now these stores have moved in, the same geographic area has more amenities, which makes the land more valuable. And because there are more people there, there are more workers, it attracts you know, offices and other businesses, they move in, well now there are even more amenities, so it's more valuable. Uh, the tax base is higher, you can afford to have nicer parks and libraries and uh, trash pickup twice a week instead of once a week or uh, whatever it is, you can have better government civ services and be better civic amenities, that makes it even more expensive. So because of this sort of quirk of the way urban land values work, you're never going to be able to completely build your way out of an affordability problem. Supply by itself. It, keep, supply keeping up with demand is necessary for affordability. It's a necessary condition. But it's not sufficient by itself. So I'm going to take a little pause here, a little break and have our second round of discussion. And when we come back, I'm gonna talk about some of the tools for improving affordability in a community. So our second round of discussion is the thing that you really wanted to talk about the first time, which is all the things you hate about the pictures. Um, and I wanna let you know that um, on purpose, there's only like one or two images from New Hampshire. Most of these pictures are from other places in the country because I don't really care about the architectural style. That's not the issue here. It's the, it's the form and, and, and how the buildings function that, we're, that we really care about. Um, so discussion number two is, what are all the things in these pictures that you don't want to see in Portsmouth? Okay, if you could start to wrap up your conversations at your table. So uh, now I want to talk a little about some tools for helping with affordability in a community. And I am taking a very broad perspective on this. So this is not you know, how you go build a new tax credit project. This is from a bigger sort of philosophical perspective. What are the different ways you can approach keeping and maintaining affordability in a community? And I said at the beginning that affordability is a really complex problem. I'm sorry to tell you there is no magic bullet. There's, I don't have a wand I can give you that will just fix the problem. It, there are lots of, lots of smaller things that have to be done in many different uh, venues, in many different ways to help deal with the situation. And that's about the best you're going to get. <laughs> so what are the different ways you can go about doing this? Um, and I'm going to talk about each of these in turn, but these are kind of the big categories that I'm thinking about. One is pre preserving affordable housing that you already have. Um, 
lowering the cost of production so that when people build new housing, it can, it can be more affordable than it would have been otherwise. Increasing the variety of housing types that are in your community so that people can pick the housing that really works for them. Um, I talked about how um, desirable neighborhoods, when people move them, they just the underlying land becomes more and more expensive because there's more and more amenities. The only way to really maintain long-term mixed income uh, residency in a neighborhood is to have some units that are shielded from that market pressure. And then there are subsidies that can help, especially in very targeted ways. And then finally, we got to look at the big picture of affordability. Lowering transportation costs is a key piece of it. So first, preserving the affordable housing that you already have. And this is the this is the only category here that I'm talking specifically about kind of federally subsidized affordable housing. All of the other tools are talking about affordability in a more general way. So it might be making the community more affordable at that median income, which is not usually what people are talking about when they're talking about, quote, affordable housing. Um, but government funds for affordable housing are very limited in the United States. We do not have a, a, a substantial program of publicly supported housing. And I don't see that changing any time in my lifetime um, for various political and cultural reasons. So using the very limited government funds that do exist for supporting affordable housing is really important. And so taking those funds and prioritizing preserving existing housing and preserving existing housing that it's in more walkable locations is really key. Um, Many of these locations need to be recapitalized and rehabilitated to have their next, you know, generation of life. Um, uh, in the Bay Area, they developed a $50 million Bay Area transit-oriented affordable housing fund. They started with $10 million from their local MPO, and they got other contributions from um, places like banks, community reinvestment funds, and use, they use those funds for low-cost financing for rehabilitating existing affordable housing in walkable locations. In, in the Bay Area, it's transit-oriented locations. In your context, I would prioritize any walkable location or location with good access to the few transit lines that you have. Um, You really want to make sure that your rules aren't punishing people for doing what you want them to do. Um, and for very good intentioned reasons, many of our government regulations make it really hard to do the things that we want people to do. Um, so for instance, um, the more onerous the, de the development environment is, the riskier it is for the developer the more that's going to push a developer towards more expensive projects because there's more margin there for mistakes and for problems to crop up and towards larger projects. So anything that involves a lot of reviews and a lot of approvals and a lot of uncertainty and risk is going to push someone into, you know, it, it's just as hard to develop a eight unit apartment building as it is to develop a 90 unit apartment building and I've got the same overhead costs. Well, I'm gonna try to develop that 90 unit apartment building. So there's a whole bunch of things we can do on the public side um, to, at the margins, make it a little easier and make things a little more affordable. Removing or reducing minimum lot sizes and minimum unit sizes. Now, most places don't really want to hear that. The International Building Code has unit sizes in it already. So try not to duplicate things. Um, try to keep uh, the same kind of standards in one place instead of having them in multiple places. Um, parking requirements. Um, uh, in a lot of places, regardless of what the zoning says, the actual limit on density are the parking requirements. 
the zoning would allow a lot more density. But when you count in, oh, I have to have two units for every, you know, two parking spaces for every unit or a parking space for every bedroom or whatever it is, you can't actually fit what the zoning allows on the lot. So the limit is, is parking. Not only is that a problem on the, on the density side for affordable, affordability, parking's expensive to build. Um, so even just a parking lot is not, it, it adds costs. Um, and for, ha for units that don't want the parking, you're forcing them to pay for something that they don't need, uh, which undermines affordability. Um, it's uh, trying, to, uh, trying to guess what the market needs and then putting it in regulations is really difficult to do. And most communities, most municipalities don't do that very well. So I know you've already had um, presentations about parking and there are other people who are much more export, expert in parking than I am. Um, but parking is an affordability issue and it's one of the easier ways to make something more affordable. Um, at the very least, you should let people count the on-street parking spaces towards their parking requirement um, if you're not going to reduce or remove the parking requirements. So I mentioned having your approval process be predictable so that a developer can tell ahead of time, how long is it going to take? What do I have to do to get this approval? Anything that is uh, requires multiple steps and requires a more discretionary kind of approval process raises the risk. Um, you can upzone some areas to allow redevelopment at higher densities. I know one of the big issues in Portsmouth is that you're built out. You don't have a lot of big chunks of land left to put in new housing. Um, but you do have more people who want to live here. So Either you're going to have to figure out how to get more housing into the existing space or it's going to get more and more expensive. Um, you don't have impact fees, so the last one really isn't a, a big issue here. Um, just uh, one more note on parking. <laughs> um, there was a study done, a Nelson Nygaard study of mixed use districts in 27 U.S. metro areas. They studied only mixed-use districts, um, and they found that on average they were 65% oversupplied with parking. Um, and these are, uh, this is Milwaukee, Houston, and um, Little Rock, Arkansas. The red on these maps are surface parking lots. <laughs> there, there's a lot of land there taken up with surface parking lots. Um, you compare that to the similar kind of map for Washington, D.C., and there's a dramatic difference in how the land is getting used and how many people can live there. Um, so we're seeing that in many places parking is oversupplied because it's not managed very well. You can manage parking to better use the supply that you have. Um, we're seeing parking is oversupplies at the same time that there are technological changes and changes in the way people use transportation that have the potential to really dramatically reduce our need for parking. Um, so think about that when you're thinking about the necessity for parking requirements. One of the big ways to really help affordability at that moderate and middle income level um, is to increase variety. Um, Opticos Design um, has coined this term, the missing middle. If you look in older neighborhoods, neighborhoods that were built uh, before the 1950s, especially you know, in the 1920s, say, there were a whole range of housing types. There were single-family detached houses, but there were also townhouses and uh, bungalow uh, courts and courtyard housing and small apartment buildings, all mixed into the same neighborhood. Right now, for the most part, we're building single-family detached houses and really large uh, multiplex you know, apartment buildings on the other end. And we're not building any of the stuff in between. 
And what we're missing out on um, with those middle um, type housing types is that those middle housing types fit into a single family detached neighborhood without messing up the character of that neighborhood. You know, you build a large apartment building in a single family neighborhood, it changes the character. You add a few fourplexes here and there on corners, it doesn't really change the character of the neighborhood. Um, so I'm gonna talk a few ways about a few different kinds of types that can do this because I think this is particularly applicable here in Portsmouth. So um, I read some background documents that suggested several years ago there was a blue ribbon commission that looked at affordability in Portsmouth and one of the things they talked about were accessory dwelling units and said, nah, that's not really for us. I'm not really sure why. You'll have to inform me about what the issue is. But I've looked at the pattern here and there's definitely room for some accessory dwelling units. These are really great for affordability for many different reasons. One, um, you get a really small unit in an existing neighborhood that probably has larger units. And so you get more variety in the neighborhood. That unit is probably more affordable than the other units in the neighborhood. The rental income on that unit helps the main house be more affordable. It helps the owner afford their larger house. And um, uh, markets that have lots of amateur landlords, lots of small landlords, have lower rental prices than markets that are dominated by large apartment buildings. And the reason that's the case is because if I have a 100 unit apartment building and my apart I have one apartment that goes vacant and my prices are kind of high and so it stays vacant for a few months, I don't really care. I've got 99 other units that are paying me rent. I'm gonna keep my rental price high until I get that person who's willing to pay it. But if I'm a property owner and I have one rental unit out back and that rental unit is paying for half of my mortgage and I lose my tenant and I can't find a tenant, a new tenant at that rent, I'm probably going to see if I can find a new tenant at a rent $50 cheaper because it's better for me to have a tenant a little cheaper than it is to have no tenant at all. So the structure of your rental market actually does affect the rental prices. So having lots of small landlords is a good thing for, for pricing. Um, here's a closer picture of that same little uh, unit. These can be done in lots of different ways. I mean, in this case, it's just a small house that was set back on the lot on the same, on the same lot. Um, lots of places take advantage of alleys to do this. And so there are apartments above these garages. This is a, an alley uh, with the houses uh, are, are in the front, you're not seeing them. Another way to build in some smaller units and more density into existing neighborhoods is with bungalow courts. So these are, um, these are courts where the houses face a, a central walkway or green. Um, you see the street is out here and these houses are all facing this green. And these are probably quite a bit smaller than the other houses that are in the neighborhood. Um, here's one. Um, uh, I believe this one is in Austin. Um, and this is what it looks like from the street. And here's a picture of it from the walkway. Um, the, that one was a fairly formal example. They can also be very informal. Here's one that has a more meandering path and is much tighter. It's a couple of different photos of that. And here's what it looks like from the street. Um, and here's a site plan, an aerial photograph that shows how these fit into an existing neighborhood. This right here is the new kind of bungalow court. Everything else around it was an existing neighborhood. These other houses are quite a bit larger and the lots are larger. And this fits in. Um, to get many smaller units into that neighborhood. Um, and this is what they look like. So especially if you are careful about the treatment on the edge that faces the street, it can insert a lot of variety of housing types and um, smaller housing types into an existing neighborhood without really changing the look on the street. 
these missing middle types are all very useful for what we like to call incremental urbanism. So the projects that get all the attention are the big projects, the mega projects, and the projects that you know, have 100 units at a time, uh, or 100 acres gets developed all at once. But most development doesn't actually happen that way, um, especially in the Northeast and uh, where you know, our parcels are really small. We've been here a long time, right? We've been splitting this stuff up a long time. We don't have 100 acres to go build a whole big new neighborhood. Um, so historically, our cities and towns have been built mostly one building at a time. Um, and um, that's why the codes and the regulations on the government side are so important, because that's shaping this one building at a time uh, stuff. If I'm coming in to build a whole you know, 100 acres at a time, I've got the overhead to really negotiate with the municipality. I can go in and say, you know, I want to build this great neighborhood, but I need you to do X, Y, and Z for me. I need you to give me a break on this, and I need you to pay for that. I need you to do this, and I can go through that. If I'm just building a duplex on a lot, I can't do that. I have to just do what the code tells me to do. So that's why the codes are so important. The other reason this missing middle type is so important, remember all those surface parking lots you know, that we saw back in Little Rock, Arkansas? Every one of those parking lots is an opportunity for one of these missing middle types. So increasing the variety of the types that you have and finding creative ways to insert them into the existing fabric is really important. And I think you ought to think about holding a design competition to figure out exactly, you know, work with a, a studio class at a university or hold a design competition to get some ideas about how to fit some of these other types into your existing neighborhoods in a way that's really compatible with the neighborhood. There is a role for some targeted subsidies. Um, I, I'm particularly fond of Live Near Your Work programs. I don't know if you've heard of them, but these are programs that are usually um, often sponsored by a major employer or co-sponsored by the municipality and a major employer, usually employers that really care whether their employees can get to work in an emergency. So hospitals, universities, um, fire departments, police departments, and they provide some subsidy for their employees to live uh, near that employment location. Um, sometimes it's a soft second mortgage that gets forgiven after a certain period of time of working, helps with down payment assistance. It can also be done on the rental development side by giving a lease guarantee to the developer and that helps the developer get financing when they might not have been able to otherwise. Um, these can bring more commuters into living in your community, which might be relevant for Portsmouth because you are a regional job center. You've got 2.24 jobs for every person here, for every worker here. Um, so lots of people are driving in to work here. Um, you could lower their transportation costs by having them live here. Um, the downside of this, though, is if you're just providing these subsidies and not increasing your housing production, you're going to make costs go up. So you've got to do them in combination with each other. Um, land banking and acquisition, that's an important role that the, the local government can play in f when parcels become available, pulling them off the market when they can afford to invest that way. Um, and there, it's especially useful in combination with community land trusts, which I'm going to talk about next. Um, density bonuses and parking reduction incentives for affordable housing or for workforce housing um, here can be really useful, but they're hard to get right. It's hard to get those market incentives right so that it's enough incentive to get the action you want to change what's happening without just giving everything away. Um, so those are tricky, but they can be helpful. Um, community land trusts are really important for maintaining a mixed income neighborhood over a really long period of time when it's a really desirable place to live. So everybody wants to move here. 
it's going to bid up prices unless you can get some of those units shielded from that market pressure. And the way a community land trust works, there's a nonprofit that owns the land. And then when people come in, they buy the house and they get a lease for the land from the nonprofit. But the nonprofit still owns the land. So that reduces the cost for that initial owner because they're only buying the house, they're not buying the land. It also helps keep affordability in the neighborhood over time because usually the lease agreement includes a formula for the uh, sale price the next time around. So the person, when they decide to move on and they sell the house, they get to keep some of the equity, uh, that's, uh, some of the appreciation but some of that appreciation goes back into the land trust. So it keeps the unit affordable. And, and it especially, um, you know, the first 10 years, the land trust is there. It's not going to make that huge of a difference. But over time, um, in an area that is really experiencing market pressures, that land trust unit is going to be much more affordable than uh, comparable market rate units in the same neighborhood. So. My last tool to recommend to you is lower your transportation costs. Um, and uh, I think that's particularly relevant here. You have relatively high transportation costs because you don't have very many options. Um, so what can you do about that? You got you know, a third of the affordability equation is transportation costs. And this is something that the public sector has a direct role in shaping. Um, there have, we've seen, a huge increase in bike commuting across the country, um, even in really cold places like Portsmouth. Um, the preferences for transportation are changing, just like preferences for where people live are changing. Millennials have much lower rates of even having a driver's license at the same age that you know than Gen Xers or Boomers did at the same age, much lower, um, and preference surveys asking them about their opinions uh, don't indicate that that's going to change anytime soon. Um, so we've seen a 62% increase in bike commuting in the U.S. Um, from 2000 to 2013. It's still very marginal most places because it started from almost nothing, but it is increasing quite a bit. Um, and the sharing economy is making some options available that weren't available before. Bike sharing programs and car sharing programs. Like I said, if a family can afford, if they can get around, if they can get by with one car because they can use these other options on those rare occasions when they need two cars, then they can really cut their transportation costs quite a bit. So now we're up to our last round of discussion. Looking at these affordability tools, what of, which of these tools do you think would make the biggest difference to improve or preserve affordability in Portsmouth? And which tools do you think will not work here? Um, what kind of changes need to be made to help make Portsmouth a more affordable place? So I'm gonna, instead of leaving this slide on just the question, I'm gonna go back to the list of tools. So. Which ones will work, which won't, what changes need to happen? Okay, I'm gonna move on and wrap things up for the evening. I know it's getting a little late. I just wanna leave you with a couple of closing thoughts. I can't resist um, giving you a little nugget of one of my pet peeves, which is, one of the impediments to doing this kind of work is that political activity, this kind of engagement, is deeply unequal. Um, the, the political participation of people in the lowest socioeconomic status is much, much lower than the political participation of, of people in the highest economic, socioeconomic status. Um, and what this means is that too many of our public involvement efforts around planning issues look like this. Or sometimes they look like this. You know? Or if we're trying really, really hard, they look like this. But they're all 
too white, too old, too higher income. Uh, and we have to do better than that. Fortunately, we are living in an age of a lot of innovation around creative placemaking. And creative placemaking fosters more creative public engagement. People are really going out to where people are to um, interact and engage with the kind of people who aren't going to come to this sort of meeting. Um, one of my favorite examples is when Philadelphia was doing their uh, establishing their bike share program. They stuck these stickers on the sidewalk where they were planning stations. And you could vote with your cell phone by text. <laughs> Almost everybody has a text-enabled cell phone these days. Um, right on the spot. Is this a good location or not? I know you're looking at some possibilities of some tactical urbanism um, efforts. And that usually engages a whole different segment of people than will come to a public hearing. So that's a great, a great way um, to reach different uh, people. I just want to invite everyone to come to Detroit for the Congress of New Urbanism. I can't resist getting that plug in. Um, we are going to have a lot of emphasis on incremental urbanism and equity in this Congress. Um, on your way out, don't forget your little dots if you want. Um, and thank you very much for having me. Um, check the PS21 website. And hey, thank you, everyone. Thank you.